Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right. Let me get my timer going. Hi, y'all. I'm Katie I am a grateful, recovered alcoholic. I've had the gift of sobriety since October the 28th of 1984, and uh, that is big stuff in my world. Let me tell you, i got uh, people who are happy to know that I am sober today. Uh, and I'm so glad to see so many of you all here at 1030 in the morning. That's nice. I know. You're, and there's some great panels. I, I wish the room was this full every time. Like, what's up with that? But, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, uh, first of all, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Nick. I, you know, he, he says he heard a voice that said he wanted to have a a women's lineup. And I guess he heard my voice. Because (laughs) the truth of the matter is, guys, is, you know, I, I, I am, I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and guess what? I happen to be a woman. (laughs) You know, and, and I swear to God, one more man says to me, I am so glad you were here so the women could hear your message. I'm like, so how are we hearing you men's message? Did you pick up on that? It's like, oh, for God's sakes, you boys need to listen to my message. Uh, you know, I know the country's mainly run by men, but uh, we know who the neck of the family is. Turn that head any way we need to. And... Uh, you know, I told I, I told my buddy Bob D. I said uh, I, I go I go toe to toe with the boys, and uh, and and Bill knows that, and and he thinks he's going to heckle me out there, but he is not going to heckle me. I uh, I I go toe to toe with the boys, and I said Bob, you know, I said God dang it, I'm a woman, and I I speak, and I I think I do a darn good job at it. I carry a solid message, and blah blah. And he goes, Well, Katie, I tell people about you all the time, and I said if they ask you for a woman, hmm. He goes, yeah, that's true. I said, so when they ask you for a speaker, they you'll give them a man traditionally. So just want to bring up that old idea to you guys <laughs> and have it on tape for the rest of our lives. <laughs> and I spoke in Oklahoma one time, and it was an all-women lineup. And I, I just I was out there It's because I really don't have a resentment. Uh, trust me, I've done plenty of inventory. I'm, lo- I'm over the resentment. Now I'm into the educating you guys. And, uh, and, and the truth is, is this guy said, I've got all women. And so I went around to people and I said, yeah, I'm speaking in Oklahoma. It's an all-women lineup. And almost every person said, is it a women's conference? Now, if it were an all-men's lineup here, would you ask if it's a men's conference? No, we'd have our token gale, who's traditionally an Al-Anon. And then, but today, our token male is Bill. Yes, and he is, and we've given him the featured space. So, um, but the, but the, but you know what? That, the thing I love about Alcoholics Anonymous is, you know, we are people who would normally not mix, and 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 I love it. Yesterday, when I got the opportunity to do the panel. Uh, they, this one girl came up to me and said, you know, right when you walked up there, I didn't like you. And I thought, I, you love that, don't you? You just love that. And she goes, and then I just fell in love with you. And, and trust me, there is plenty of people in here that will not like me. And that's just going to have to be your work. The, you know, the, the beauty behind that is we have a four-column inventory, and you just put my name in column one. And then you just, see, it works out wonderfully. But, um, you know, I've been sober for 26 years. Uh, a lot has happened in 26 years. I uh, got sober at 26 years old. I, um, I am, it's an honor and a privilege any time to speak behind the podium. I, I've gotten to know Lauren, and uh, we had a wonderful ride. Uh, Andrea was in the car with us, and we had a wonderful ride here. They got probably more of me than they were expecting. But uh, I'm a big fan of believing that God has asked me to be an agent. You know, it says it in the third step. He is the principal, he's the director, and I am his agent. And I am willing to stand on the firing line of Alcoholics Anonymous. I do not take alcoholism lightly. I do not take alcoholism as a self-help program. I do not think it's about that. It's not about your feelings, period. It's about a disease that will kill you. 
And if I let you go too long in your feelings, you'll end up dying. You really will in this disease. It's, it, is, it is a progressive disease. The steps are circular. They are not linear. And we are in them all the time. Alcoholics Anonymous was not a big part of my life in my middle, middle uh, sobriety. And uh, I've got a story about that. I share that my experience when I was, uh, when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, my experience, the fact that I stayed sober was uh, clearly uh, God's grace. The only problem is I don't know how long God's grace works. And when it stops working is the day you drink. And so I don't uh, pass on what was taught to me in early sobriety because it is my experience, and I assure you I don't want to do that. I want to come straight out of the book. And that's where I ended up coming back to. I'm excited to be here on your coastline. Uh, Riptides don't go in the water. And I brought two bathing suits. That will not be happening. And, uh, and in my room it says, what to do if a tsunami comes. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm, okay, let's be sure we have this at the coast every year. Uh, don't go in the water, and if a tsunami comes, you're screwed. And uh, so I thought, okay, well, that's a, they, they do their coastline a little different than we do in Texas, but... All righty. Um, and I am, I am a lizard, man. Have you guys paid attention to the weather in Texas? We have had over 60 days of over 100, which is, you know, I can do 98 pretty well. I can actually do 101 really well. But it's 107 has been tough, and I'm a lizard, man. I, I like to live on a rock. And uh, it, you people are freezing up here. I'm telling you, you are freezing up here. I didn't even bring the right apparel. I am just not, this whole deal's not good for me. And, you, you know, you, you walk around in a jacket and shorts on. It's like, what is up with that? What? The whole body needs to be covered, man. And then the apparel, well, the apparel, we won't even go there. Uh, I know, I know. I live in Austin, Texas. We have several of y'all there. And... Uh, and we have an REI, so I personally have never graced the doors of REI, but I know it's there. And, uh, but I, I am, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 steps. I, um, you know, the book says that we are to um, share uh, what we were like and what happened and what I'm like today. Oh, and I want to encourage you guys something. You know, we always say in the, in the beginning of a meeting to silence your cell phone. I encourage you, could you turn it off? I have watched many of you guys on your cell phones texting and looking at Facebook. And i got to tell you, it's a manifestation of self. It's anything you can do to not be present. And so please put your cell phone, hit the off button for one hour. I swear to God, nothing's going to happen in one hour. And if you want to talk to your buddy about me across the room, just talk afterwards. You don't have to be going... You know, she's bugging me now. Um, and because the truth of the matter is, is you can't not look at your phone. You can't do it. You've got to turn it off and put it up. Because what self will do is when I get, when God is getting ready to speak to you, you'll flip that baby open. That's, I mean, it's just what we do. We will avoid the message because we're asleep. Oh, my God, I was asleep so long in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's heartbreaking. My story is very painful. It's, it's got some, some sad stuff, but it's all about untreated alcoholism. And there is a ton of it sitting in this room. I know because God said, come to the coast where you won't swim and there might be a tsunami. But I need you to be the agent and tell these people that they're sitting in untreated alcoholism. Now, I don't know who you are. But hopefully, if you'll turn your phone off, you might listen long enough to hear a message that might wake you up. Okay, so what happened? I I have a home group. My home group is the primary purpose group. We study the big book line by line, word by word. We have a 1935 dictionary. I love it, man. Look up the words, what they used to mean Uh, back in 1935. It'll give you a new meaning of the book. And uh, uh, this meeting we have, uh, it's a Tuesday night meeting at 730 in Austin, and we have 200 people. Studying the big book. How, how wonderful is that? Yeah. And, and, and you, know, you know, everybody was like, well, you know, the people we thought would come don't come, you know. And, uh, you know, you got to write inventory on that, you know. <laughs> you know, how many of y'all have written enough inventory on Alcoholics Anonymous members? Oh, my God. I've written more inventory on you people than I have my own family. You know, it's bugging the crap out of me. Oh, there's big head Doug. <laughs> you know. And, uh, but the truth of the matter is, guys, is that, 
that this is a program that is going to save my life. And the minute I start making you people the problem, I am in deep trouble, deep, deep, deep trouble. I, um, I have a daughter. She's 32 years old. She decided to move to Tacoma. <sighs> like that's a good idea. I know. She's going to be good shopping at REI eventually. I know she is. I swear. It's like, oh, my God, honey. Uh, and she has got my grandson, which, Marie, I just so felt for you there. You know, she stole my grandson right out from underneath me in the middle of the night, just packed up and moved out here to go right next to Canada, for God's sakes. And, uh, you know, I couldn't, couldn't have gone to New Mexico. No, heavens no, mother, get on a plane, travel all day. And... Uh, and then she just had our, our second grandchild, Holly, six weeks ago, and I'm so excited I'm here. that We let the other grandmother go. Uh, I won't even go into that story. Yeah. More inventory. And um, because my son back in, in Texas, who is going to probably live close to his mother for the rest of his life because that's what you boys do, and uh, he uh, – he just had our uh, third grandchild, and uh, so I got uh, little baby Ryder at home, and he's uh, a month old, and it's been wonderful. Grandchildren for alcoholics are do-overs, and they're God's greatest gift of do-overs. I am not kidding you. Max, my five-year-old grandson that lives up here, uh, said, uh, Graham, can I, have a, can I have a popsicle before dinner? It's like, you can have ten. <laughs> I mean, I don't Run with scissors. That's fine. I don't that's not my job. I'm no longer, I surrender that job. I did it all my life, right? Um, I'm 53 years old. I, I see getting old as a privilege. Uh, that's not the case in the world. Uh, people don't seem to like getting old. I, I see it as getting old. I look at the alternative and it sucks, right? And so why in the world are we not going to make getting old a wonderful gift? It's absolutely a wonderful gift. And uh, so I look at getting old as a, as a privilege, and I, I am grateful to see that. You know, in our book it says the most satisfying years of our existence lie ahead. It doesn't say it peters out oh, when you get old, you know, and watch out, boy, it really, it really sucks. You know, it... It's like, so what, how am I looking at this deal? You know, how am I looking at this deal? But keep in mind, it's not a self-help program. This little motivational talk will not do the trick. And what ends up happening is, see, we come to these things, we get right up next to the solution, and then we, we go home and we get involved in our lives, and, and we miss it. And we miss it. We don't do what is required is the work. So... I, uh, I take alcoholism very, very seriously, and you'll, you'll see as we go. I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about, you know, I'd rather step on your, your feelings than stand on your grave, and, uh, and I've, I've, I think we've all established that by now, yes? <laughs> and, and here's the deal. It's funny. We were talking at the table this morning. Is uh, I sponsor a lot of women. I sponsor about 45 women, and, and uh, you can sponsor a lot of women when you keep them in the work. I mean, it's, uh, your troubles are of your own making, okay? Let's, let's go from there. I don't want to really hear the whole storyline because it's all a delusion anyway, right? You know, and, and we women got a storyline, you know. And, and the truth of the matter is, guys, is that when you sponsor a lot of people, if you're going to ask me to sponsor you, have you figured out my personality? I'm not, the, I'm not the nurturing sponsor. As a matter of fact, I worry for the nurturing sponsor. You'll nurture somebody right into the grave, right? And, and that's just how your self manifests. If you need somebody a little easier, well, your you're, you're self manifests that way. You're working, a, you're working a scam. And the truth of the matter is, is man, there's, I mean, if, if you lose a parent, man, we're going to be, we're going to be feeling your pain. You know, we're going to, we're going to see some sorrow. I'm going to carry you through that. I'm going to get you in touch with that power that can help you. But if you're going to come to me crying over a boy too much, there's no crying in baseball. I'm done. I'm done with this crying. You know what? I mean, you got to stop. And I, and I think women are, are uh, v- women are very, uh, we're crafty. We're very crafty. Very crafty. Uh, I have a disease that started long before I ever took a drink. Woo, we doggies. I would never have looked at that had I not gotten sober. I would not have looked at my life the way I see it today at all. I mean, I, my life is, my childhood is totally different than, than I used to see it after inventory and inventory and inventory and work in this program. But the truth of the matter is, is I'm, I'm the baby of three. I was tortured, uh, you know, shut up in the old uh, fold-out couch. You know, they swear to God they're not going to leave the room, and they leave me in the fold-out couch, you know. 
<laughs> you know, and I fell for it every time, every time. But um, uh, the my my mother, I always I would have told you today that my father loved my sister more than me. I, I clearly knew that. My sister was was wonderful and perfect, and I actually loved my sister deeply. We never were competitive, which is a little unusual. Most people that start a statement out like that have a, a competition. My sister and I are still best friends. We're 18 months apart. My brother was was the little Bing Crosby. You know, we were all born in the 50s, and he had a little white hat on, and you know, the little bow tie, and and he was the prince. And uh, but the but my mother, I was my mother's favorite, and uh, we lived in a, a you know an upper middle America family. My dad was well educated. He was an ex football player, played for the Steelers, and uh, it was mainly known for the Miami Hurricanes. But um, you know, one time we had the entire Buffalo Bills at our house, so booze in my house equaled fun. Always was fun. I loved it. It is. Alcohol, to me, just looked like that's what people did. And we always had a party going on at our house all the time. And so and I just loved it. I loved everything that went on. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, my mother gets sick. I'm eight years old. I don't qu- really quite know what's going on. And back in the 60s, you know, it, there was no feelings discussed in the family. Everything's going to be fine. There was, you were, we were small children. You weren't even allowed in the hospital. Uh, do you remember that, you guys? I mean, it, it's funny. I would never have thought of that today had I not gotten sober, but kids weren't allowed in the hospital so um, for childhood illnesses, and pe- we didn't have all the antibiotics what, that we have today. And So we're walking in the hospital, and everybody's whispering, and it's all creepy. And, um, and then come to find out, we walk in the room, and there's my beautiful little mother, you know, uh, in the bed with all these tubes in her and what have you, and, and uh, then the next day she died, and uh, and it was overnight to me, but my father had known for some time that she was not doing well, she had a kidney disease, and so what ended up happening at that point is just, it, it, it mind boggles me, my father, well, he remarried in six weeks, let's just start with that part, okay, this is the 60s, 1966. He's a traveling salesman. The planes are all full of men, right? And the flight attendants that are all laying each other, right? I mean, that's just what was going on back in the day, right? Remember, the Braniff girl had the uh, Velcro skirt <laughs> for quick entry. Hello. You know, and... Uh, but my dad has pictures of them all on the plane. They all had their hats on, you know, and that's what was going on back then. Now, of course, you don't know that, but I know that today. Uh, and so my dad ends up remarrying three times in an 18-month period and has four live-in housekeepers, into which my brother tells me he's messing around with all them. Lovely. And... Um, so all I saw was seven women come through our house in an 18-month period. Now, they, they, I just swore to God when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous that that's what made me alcoholic. I thought something made me alcoholic. I had no idea that I suffered from a disease, that I had an allergy, and I had an obsession, and the malady shoved me into all that. I didn't get all that. And I swear to God, I didn't hear that when I came into AA. I really didn't. You people were telling me that, but I didn't hear that. I thought, no. (laughs) See, if you had what I had, you'd drink too. And the truth of the matter is, is what did, what is that important for? My childhood and my adulthood is important because of my old ideas. See, I operate, I love the way you put a core belief system. Call it whatever you want to call it. Katie has a ticker tape list of what I think and what I believe. In, the, in we agnostics, we call it prejudgments, right, prejudice. And, and the truth of the matter is, is I think men are, women should be, children are, AA members should, the government is, Republicans are, Democrats are. I mean, have you ever met somebody and, and you really like them and then all of a sudden they tell you their political views? And you go, oh, see, I liked you there for a minute, but mm-mm. Oh, see, if you're one of them... See what I mean? So I've got all these old ideas, just like that. Boom, boom, boom. And I got a ton of old ideas behind marriage, behind women, behind this. I personally have always loved women. I have never been the big fan of women not liking women. I mean, when I was out drinking, we were in quite a bit of competition. But the truth of the matter is, is I love my sisters. I loved them all. I love, I love women. And, and here's the other tricky deal, guys. Women come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and they, and, and we get you boys to buy this hook, line, and sinker. Well, you know, women, they don't like each other. And you, you, yeah. 
Well, that is such an old idea. That is baloney. And what you boys need to do is traipse them right over to a group of women instead of letting them stand in your herd. But to, to some degree, you let them stand in your herd, and we're working you again because we work you like a fiddle, right? We throw it out. Oh, yeah. Ha, 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 ha. So the next time a woman says that she doesn't like women, introduce her to the couple of the gals in the group. And then you women need to see when a woman comes in, you need to beeline it over to her. And the prettier she is, make it over there quick. Right? Oh, I swear you boys are stupid around pretty girls. Stupid. Just stupid. Oh. Okay, I, I, I digress. Back to me. Um, so what, what ends up happening, right? So, so I am, I'm watching all this come down. The last mother that stayed, now keep in mind it was only 18 months. Oh, am I already running y'all out of the room? Well, rats. Um, so I end up uh, 18 months and we end up landing this one mother, right? And, and I got to tell you guys, I did not care for her. She and I fought like crazy, right? Fought like crazy. And I just, I didn't play by the rules in the house. I didn't like school. Uh, and thank God we were the generation that didn't have to show up to school and you could still get the good grades. You poor kids, you younger generation, man, you're screwed. I'm sorry. But you, you got to be at school. See, we didn't have to be at school. And so... What, what I did is I, I couldn't stand school. I couldn't stand my stepmother. I started drinking when I was 12. And, and I'll tell you, 12 to me was not really too early. It looked pretty normal. And I grew up in Houston, Texas. My brother was out doing a ton of outside issues. And, uh, and my sister was running with the boys that did the outside issues. And, and what we ended up having to do is we, um, in order to get booze at 12, outside issues were very easy to get. I'm a, I'm a big fan of singleness of purpose, guys. I'm here to talk about alcoholism. I have extensive use with other things, but this is Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm talking about my drinking. I'm talking about my alcoholism. And, and so I am an alcoholic. And what we used to have to do is sit in front of the 7-Eleven, and we had to wait for creepy guy, right? You have to wait. And, and Mo said the pervert of the neighborhood, right? We had to wait for the creepy guy. Now, let me fast forward into AA today and just take a moment to talk about predators. We have an old idea that the predators in Alcoholics Anonymous are the boys. They are not. You're looking at a predator. I'm 12 years old, and I'm waiting to find a grown man that I can manage to get me booze. Who's working who? See, so once again, I think what ends up happening in AA is, is you boys will defend these girls because you'll get the shield. Bob, I heard, has been hitting on the newcomer. And it's like, uh, no, the newcomer knows exactly what she's doing, trust me. Yeah, she's getting that cup of coffee like this. <laughs> she just has Bob as bugging her. See, Bob's in her way. So if she can tell Bill to get Bob out of the way. <laughs> and, and, and what's so sad here, guys, is the truth of the matter is, is if, if we've got a problem in Alcoholics Anonymous, come tell the girls. I'll take care of the boy. Right? But first I'm going to tell the girl, you are shaking it up every time you go get that coffee. Don't try to fool me who the predator is here. Remember, I'm the 12-year-old girl that looked for the pervert to buy me the booze, and then I had to get rid of him. And I could every time. It was like flicking a booger off your finger, but you could eventually get rid of it. It took a little while. You, you got on that bicycle and you rode hard into the woods, you know, and he's in the car trying to grab. Oh, and, and, and I just have to tell you, you know, the creepy guy is in the room right now. So I know you're here too. Not fooling me. But, you know, I got to, uh, I'm going to fast forward now. You know, I, I got to tell you, I did a, um, school for me was, was I, I did not care much for the educational system. Never have. Still don't today. But if, and so what I did is I became a professional cheater all through school. And I'm telling you what, guys, I'm not talking mildly cheating. I'm talking breaking into the school and, and, and changing test scores. And all you needed was a number two pencil, thank God. You didn't need computers and all that. And uh, I, I had this idea that if I dropped out of school, I was a loser. 
So it, at all costs, I was to get a diploma, but the, the education I could have cared less for. And I've got to tell you today, I've done enough inventory work on it to tell you that I do not need an education to be okay. Uh, if you got robbed, if your alcoholism robbed you of an education and you want to go back to school, I'm your biggest cheerleader. For me, I have no desire. I drove by OU one time. I was speaking in Oklahoma, and I drove by the campus OU, and Charlie looked at it. My husband, he goes, God, that's a beautiful campus. I thought, looks like a prison to me. I got, <laughs> whew, uh-uh, ha, 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 ha. And uh, I just don't care. And, you know, it's funny to say that to the world because everybody thinks there's something wrong, and the truth of the matter is, guys, I don't care. I watch the news, Egypt, something's going on. Click, I don't care. I, I just don't care. Now, the wiener thing had me intrigued for a while. And, and that was, that was a, I wasn't quite sure who he was. I knew he had something to do with the government, but he was not a very attractive man anyway. And, hmm. But um, I, I don't know about geography. You know, I told everybody I'm going to the coast in Seattle, back in Texas. And they go, Katie, I don't think Seattle's on the coast. Like, oh, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> it's Washington. It's not the state of Seattle. It's Washington. And, uh, but, you know, I, I swear, I, I'm, just, I'm so okay with that. I, I'm just so okay with that. I don't care where Venezuela is. I just don't care. And uh, just get me on a plane, get me to where I'm going, and I'm fine. You know, Charlie's pulling up all this information about where we're going because he loves history, and he'll say, you know, Katie, now, now the, um, the Nile River, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, shut up. You know, we had, we had, my husband just thinks, he stopped the Weather Channel one time because it had the whole United States, and he's going he's gonna to teach me because his mother was a, a, a first-grade teacher for 42 years, you know. And uh, I just don't care, don't care. If I ask you how to spell something, do not sound it out. Tell me how to spell it. I don't want to learn. I want you to tell me. And... Uh, we had this guy from Norway come to our meeting, and I, I sponsor this little gal. We call each other Dumb and Dumber. And, uh, oh, my God, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and she said to me, um, uh, he's from Norwegia, isn't he? And I said, oh, I said, silly, he is Norwegian. <laughs> and I swear, everybody standing around us was like, oh, boy. <laughs> but we can... We can carry an amazing message of Alcoholics Anonymous to you. Although when they handed me this book, when I first walked in, I thought, oh, oh, that's going to be a problem. I mean, I can read. Uh, I can't comprehend. That's my problem. I can read. I can write. I can get there. As a matter of fact, I've been self-employed because that's pretty much what you have to do if you don't have an education. You know, run your own business and be your own boss so nobody can tell you what to do. And uh, I've been in a very successful businesswoman for 30 years. I've been in the fitness business. I'm sure that you can tell by my arms. Uh, I know. I know. I swear, in my receiving lines, uh, people always say, man, your arms look great. It's like, did you hear my AA message at all? And by the way, y'all's receiving lines are a little weak. Just wanted to give me a tip. Um, but, okay, fast forward. I have a child, and for you guys that have kids and are alcoholic and drinking alcoholically, it is horrible. It is absolutely horrible. Children are a problem. They like to get up early. They like to eat. They like food. Food in the fridge. And that does not work with alcoholism. Active alcoholism. I drug this little girl place that she had no business being. She was five years old when I got sober, so she, I drug her all over the place. I got pregnant when I was, or I had her when I was 21, and uh, I knew nothing. And it, it is heartbreaking. I know incomprehensible demoralization, and I don't share a lot of time talking about my drinking because my, I'm a woman, and I drank, and it's ugly. It is very, very ugly. It makes me uncomfortable. I know it makes you uncomfortable. But I drug that little girl all over the place. She slept in the car when I couldn't find a babysitter, and I'd pull up to the bar and you know, be able to look out the window to see her out there. And I thought that was pretty impressive. I thought I was actually doing pretty good until I told some guy at the bar, and he was shocked. You know, I thought, oh, kiss my ass. You know what I mean? I mean, I just was mad, mad, mad. And the longer I drank, the madder I got. And I knew it about, I, I, I drank, uh, I partied till I was about 20. And then I did the best I could to try not to drink. I did a lot of outside issues, um, while pregnant, but I didn't want to drink, you know, all that was coming out. And so I ended up uh, 
not drinking, and it was a sacrifice, and everybody knew I was sacrificing while I was pregnant. But, boy, after that, you talk about progressing. In alcoholism, the way we progress, I cannot differentiate the true from the false. My alcoholic life is the only normal one. By the time I started really drinking after she was born, I deserved it. And I drank, and I drank hard, and I drugged that kid all over the place, and it was just horrible. By the time I finally came into Alcoholics Anonymous at 26 years old, it was the weekend of Halloween, and I was dressed as Tina Turner, much like I am today. <laughs> and uh, this is actually my funeral dress. I, I love to go to funerals. Uh, I, I, I see funerals as a celebration of life, and I love to go to funerals, and so I have my cute little dress and shoes and all. But um, I'm dressed like Tina Turner. My hair is gold, and, and I end up wandering into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous chasing a boy, imagine that, who is six years sober, and I don't understand what that means. And um, I, I met him out and about, and, and uh, you know, long story short, they come to the house because that's what we do, right? It was the 80s. There was no, no fear of dying uh, from sexual activity. And uh, so, you know, they come to the house, and we're all talking, and da 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 and I wanted these boys' attention so bad that I suggested I'd go to an AA meeting. And I remembered thinking, I really like this guy. Maybe he'll fix me. See, that's what we women do. We look to you men to fix us. We're doing it in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and, and you're buying it. Okay, that's him. Um, I don't know why I feel this message is so important to say. I don't normally beat it in. But um, maybe God says, he, you know, do it. Say it, do it. But the truth is, and I'm not going to men sponsor men, women sponsor women. Don't don't think I'm going to that. I'm just saying, let's. Get, I love that he got all women. I love it because we need to be able to stand here and talk about how we make you guys work. We work you like a fiddle. Come on, girls, you're with me on that. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh boy. And so what? We, and 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 here's the thing: you're doing the best you can, and we're still working a number on you. And so I'm working these two boys over, and I'm telling them, you know, that I got a drinking problem, and I know on some level I do. I'd thought of it long before, but I just kept thinking it was the outside issues that were bringing me down. Don't touch my booze, blah blah blah. So I come into Alcoholics Anonymous that next day. It sounded like a great idea at four in the morning. It's not looking like such a good idea at 9 a.m. And and I'm in there, and I, my hair is gold, and Still, and, and I, I'm thinking I look really cute, you know, talk about a disease of delusion. And they said, is, is anybody here for their first meeting? And I kid you not, they, they're like this. <laughs> I thought, me? You know, my, my hair's gold and kind of bent to one side, you know. And, and uh, oh. But what I found in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous absolutely blew me away. I walked into a room of you people. I thought, my old ideas told me that it was trench coats and winos and, and that that wasn't me. And it was a room full of people that looked just like you. And they absolutely embraced me. The women embraced me. They loved me. And as a matter of fact, the women scooped me up and took me away from the two boys. I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, I want to be, I had one on each side. You know? And uh, I, I, was, I was thinking, it's all working, it's all working. But I was one of the lucky ones. I fell absolutely in love with the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, my God. And, and I love this other part. You guys took my number. You didn't give your number out. I mean, you didn't uh, say, here, call me sometime and give me your number. I'm not about to call somebody. Oh, my God, are you out of your mind? People say, well, they don't want it then if they're not going to call. Who, who, pardon me? Who says that? I'm at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, for God's sakes. What, do you think I came in because I burnt the toast? No. My world is falling apart. Take my number. Please call me because I can't pick the phone up. See, I mean, we, we, we get so misunderstood in this program, and, and, and it's like, you know, people say, well, I don't sponsor anybody. Nobody's asked me. What? What? When did that happen? You just walk up to the guy, the new guy raises their hand, you walk up to him, and say, hey, are you new? Yeah, how many days do you have? Three. Do you have a sponsor? No. Okay, I'll be it. That's how that works. They don't know. They don't even know where the bathroom is. <laughs> you know what I mean? They go, okay, okay, okay. And personally, I like to pull them out of the meeting. I like to take them out there and give them a fatal dose of alcoholism. I don't want to hear about your five DWIs in the meeting. I don't want to hear about what, what the a cause of alcoholism, what happens when we drink too much. I can introduce you to plenty of people that drink too much and get DWIs. Doesn't make them an alcoholic. 
So we've got to take them out there. We've got to give them a fatal dose of alcoholism. We've got to talk about the obsession. We've got to talk about the uh, allergy. We've got to talk about what precedes that first drink. When you swear to God that morning, you are not going to drink. I don't want to know what happens when you drink. Of course you get in trouble. Duh. Yeah. So I'm one of the lucky ones. I love the laughter. I hadn't laughed in a long, long time. And, and one of the boys that was sitting to my right, we got married. Is that the best? Uh, and, um, yeah, we women are powerful. Uh, but, the, but the truth of the matter is he had six years, and he, he kept saying, this is all wrong. It's wrong. I'm like, no, no, it's all good. It's all good. Look into my eyes. It's all good. He goes, no, you know, you're, you're ten minutes sober. This is not good. Yes, it is. And thank God nobody... You know, on page 69, it talks about that we cannot be the arbiter of anyone's sex life. This don't get in a relationship for the first year is not literature. It's not in our book. As a matter of fact, we don't, we don't usually play by those rules well. And, and, and I tell people, if you're going to get in a relationship, just put your seatbelt on, man. The ride is going to be way bumpier. But I, we can work with this. Now, if relationships become a problem for you, then I'll step in. But up until then, I'm so grateful nobody did. My husband and I were married 20 years. And if somebody would have said you're not supposed to be in a relationship, I don't know that that, I I think I would have fought to stay in it. Instead, I wanted to stay in it. He read me the big book. We actually had quite a romantic little thing. He read me the big book. And then at some point, I passed him up. (laughs) Uh, Years to come. But um, what ended up happening is I worked a program, unbeknownst to me, not, not because of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Trust me, I'm sure you people were talking. I was just asleep. Uh, thank God we didn't have cell phones back then because I would have been texting and Facebooking and all that stuff just to keep me completely out of the uh, moment. But I worked a program based on the abstinence of alcohol. Alcohol was my problem because when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I fell in love with Joe Gordon. He was the absolute light of my life. He adopted my daughter. We had another baby. My career took off, and all the gifts of sobriety just took me right out of the rooms. And I was an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was into the big book studies. We were doing Joe and Charlie. I was reading the book. We were doing the deal. And then we got a mortgage, and then we got a couple of new cars, and then I had a career that wanted me to travel around the world. Can you see how AA is kind of a bit bit of a problem? And this selfishness and self-centeredness really wasn't me. I mean, I was voted most popular in school. Sorry for you guys, but uh, that ain't me. I'm not stingy, and I'm not conceited. And so um, my problem was alcohol. And now that the obsession is gone, which it's gone at 90 days for most of us, yes, once the obsession is gone, I thought I'd been rocketed into the fourth dimension. So I became a victim of my own delusion that I could rest satisfaction and happiness if I just managed well. And let me tell you, I managed my ass off. I absolutely managed. I managed that family. We were in counseling all the time back then. It was the 80s, and that was a time when it was all family of origin, codependency, you know, all that yada, hada, hada, hoo-ha. And, uh, and the truth of the matter is, guys, that's all good stuff. But what I did is I, I learned as much as I could about myself so I could fix me. And I didn't get in touch with this power. And I'm three years sober, and I've got all these gifts of sobriety coming, and all of a sudden you people are, well, you're just bugging me. Bad. Itchy, scratchy, merry. You know what I mean? And I'm sitting in the rooms, and I know who's going to share the same old, same old that they share all the time. And the next thing you know, I'm just picking you off. And you're really bothering me. And people always say, well, you know, they quit going to meetings. Like meetings are going to keep me sober. Meetings are not treatment for alcoholism. Sorry, they're one side of our triangle. They are crucial. The fellowship is crucial that you have it. Stay in the middle of the herd, but it absolutely will not keep you sober. And I'm living proof of it. And so what ended up happening is my husband says to me, you know what, Katie, I think we need to enlarge our spiritual life on page 14. I thought there was a period there because I don't, I'm not a strong reader, right? I'm not really dissecting the lines and where the, the way they're written and studying the book. I'm reading the book. And I said, okay, what are you going to do? He goes, let's go to church. I thought, huh. Well, this always goes over really well in the Bible Belt of the South, which, you know, I'm from Texas. I am not from the South. Let's make that clear. I am from Texas. 
Yes, thank you. It was our, Texas was its own country. It still is. And um, so in the South, we got the Bible Belt, right? We got some strong religious beliefs in the South. And, 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 and up in Dallas, you know, you go straight across there, it's tough. And so I thought, I, I really don't, you know, I don't really have a, I was raised Catholic. He was speaking in some sort of Latin. All I could do is flick a booger on my sister. You know, that was the highlight of the, the hour you sat in there. And, and, um, and so I told Joe, okay, let's go. And so we end up going into this non-denominal church, right? A, a, a twist of Pentecostal. And, uh, they got big screens and everybody's doing this and we're singing. And I'm like, Wow, I love this. And I mean, I fell in love with that church. And before you know it, AA just kind of became secondary because, you know, you people are kind of bugging me. And, and it became secondary, and I'm going to enlarge my spiritual life. And I don't have the drink problem anymore, and life is good. And so the next thing you know, we're, all we're doing is church. We tried to bring some sort of 12-step program into there, which was absolute disaster. And... Uh, and then Joe and I are about three years in this church and uh, not doing AA, and of course not drinking, and uh, I've been sober the entire time. But what ended up happening is I completely lost my mind. I am stark raving sober without the, the program, the fellowship, and uh, the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I'm sitting there at an intersection. I will never forget this. There is a woman. It, you know, when, when you could take a right on red, do you all remember that? I mean, that was, I think, bigger than the eye iPhone personally, but you know, I'm sitting there and you could take a right on red and this woman is in front of me and she's not taking a right on red. Oh no, she's not. And I am just gripping that wheel thinking, you know what? I am going to shove you into that intersection under the name of Jesus. (laughs) See, I fell in love with Jesus. And what you have to understand is we are chameleons. We will fit in anywhere we need to be. And Joe and I literally transformed and looked Amish. I mean, Joe's hair was to the side. It was no longer up and back. It was to the side. I had the long smock on. You know, this was Tina Turner in a smock. And, uh, And I absolutely fell in love with Jesus. And here's the funny thing. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying don't go to church. Oh my God, that's not at all what my message is. I'm saying in conjunction with. It works. AA must be first and foremost, not the church. I've seen people pray and meditate their way right out of AA. I've seen them do it with the, you know, sit at the feet of the Dalai Lama, do it Eastern religion, do it Western religion. I don't really care. But the truth of the matter is, is when I found Jesus, I thought it was necessary that you people find Jesus. So I really bothered every one of my AA friends, right? And what ends up happening, guys, is I, I go home. I almost push this woman in the middle of that intersection. I get home, and I tell Joe, my God, I'm not doing good, Joe. And he goes, I'm not doing well either, Katie. And I go, what are we going to do? And he goes, let's go back to AA. I said, that's a good idea. And we got in the car and went up to our old home group. And I leaned over to him, and I said, my God, we're home. We're with our people. And I felt this sense of relief that was spectacular. Unfortunately, what I didn't know what was going to happen was for the next 10 years, I did what I call meeting-based sobriety. And I sat in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and relied on you to read the big book. And I picked up all my big book knowledge from you. I never touched the big book. Joe never even thought to pick it up. He picked up the Bible because we still had a strong Christian background, right? That's what I choose today. It's so funny. You can mention Jesus up here makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. You mention the Dalai Lama. Everybody's like, yeah, whatever. You know, Tupac Oprah whoever that is, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but, oh, you mentioned Jesus and it, oh, oh, and in the South, I mean, people are like, did she say Jesus? And she keeps saying it. Oh boy, blasphemy. And I'm like, whatever. But the truth is, is that Joe and I sat in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous doing meeting based sobriety. And it says, guys, in our book, listen to this. You know, it talks about middle of the road. At some of these, we balked. Half measures availed us nothing. But if you sit there and you talk to somebody and you say, so you're sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, when was the last time you read your big book? When was the last time you worked a step? What, have you made all your amends? Most people say no because you're doing the same thing I'm doing. Book war- Heck, we read what the most read literature is, how it works, the least listened to. I guarantee you are all on Facebook at that point. Right? 
on how it works. I mean, and this is me. I don't do Facebook. So what I do is when people walk in, I'm like, <laughs> while they're doing all the readings. So, I mean, I do it just the same thing. Trust me. No judgment here. Just an observation to wake you up. Boy, it's warm in this room, isn't it? Okay, turn on the air conditioner. Heck, all you guys got to do is probably open that door and it'll be freezing in about two seconds. <laughs> God almighty. <sighs> so, I am sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous dying. Ten years. The grace of God is amazing. But when the light shuts off, I don't know when that is. It says on page 25, if you are as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there is no middle of the road solution. If you have not read your big book in two weeks, you're probably not doing the deal. When do we get to not read this book? When do we not get to study it? This is spiritual literature. It goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Oh, I know. Now everybody's going, oh, she's bugging me now. (laughs) It says, we were in a position where life has become impossible. Anybody in here feel that way? Absolutely. And if we had passed into the region from which there is no return through human aid, We had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out our consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could. And the other was to accept spiritual help. I'm telling you guys, blotting out, you know, when it says the bitter end, this is what I want to say. How bad is the bitter end? Really, explain the bitter end. Because, you know, I mean, I've been through some tough stuff before. But the truth is, is for me to accept spiritual help. And what we end up doing is we think that spiritual help is the 11th step. Oh, heavens no. As a matter of fact, when I'm blocked from the sunlight of the Spirit, the praying and meditating falls on deaf ears. I can't even sit focused long enough. I mean, I'm, I, I don't even sit in silent meditation. I'm not that, that person. I don't do that. I do deep thought. I do deep prayer. I do that kind of stuff. But our meditation goes from 20 minutes to 10 minutes to 3 minutes to its daily reflections on the back of the toilet. Right? And that's it. And then let the games begin. And that's exactly how it went in my life. It became God's will, my will, God's will, my will. I'd hand in the baton. I'd go, God, this is getting bad. You take it over. And God says, okay, you just sit tight. Ooh, no, bad idea. Give me back the baton. You are working way too slow here, man. I got this one. I got this one. To where praying never even entered my mind. I eventually just said, you're out of here. I mean, I'll bring you in on the big stuff. (laughs) I mean, if my kids get sick, oh, I'm coming to God. Oh, yeah. But the rest of this daily life stuff, no, 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 not necessary. And so what I ended up doing is I became a slogan slinger, right? And that's what that's what most people do in AA. As a matter of fact, people that aren't reading the book, what page do they quote? Acceptance is the key because they know nothing else. That's what I did. Acceptance is the key. Acceptance, guys, is the promise. That is like telling me to work the promise promises, hoping the steps come true. If you sling a slogan at me after I just told you what my problem is and you go, you know what, you just need to turn that over, I'm going to have to punch you right here, right now, right in front of everybody. I'm taking you out. Did you not just hear what I told you? I got big problems. And what you need to do is get me to see where my troubles are of my own making. You need to do a quick little mini tent step on me. You need to take me outside. Maybe let me write a quick four-column inventory. Heck, it takes 15 minutes. You know, this whole thing about people going, oh, I'm still working on my inventory. No, you're not. You're not working on your inventory. You're not doing it. (laughs) You know, uh, an inventory, a real inventory takes two hours. The big one, period. Not four months. And so I was this slogan slinger and everybody in AA loved me because I was the most popular girl in the world, you know. And I was funny and, you know, I could just do it. And here's my husband's working on this little Jeff Foxworthy thing. He says, you might be an untreated alcoholism if you're going to uh, five meetings a week and sharing at every meeting and nobody's asking you to sponsor them. It's, uh, uh, ha! So, uh, then, so then what settles in? It's untreated alcoholism. People say, we have all different words for it, flat, period, dry. No, it's untreated. We have 12 steps that treat a disease that will eventually kill me. It will kill people who don't even have it. You know, I am in untreated alcoholism. I'm in danger. If I were diabetic and I'm not checking my blood sugar levels, you think people would go, oh, it's no big deal. Just go to another diabetic meeting, talk about it, sit around. No, I mean, it's a serious, serious place to be because I don't know how long you can stay sober in untreated alcoholism. 
And what ends up happening is you're going to do two things, one of two things. You're either going to kill yourself or drink. That's what we do. And, and that's, that's, that's the news of untreated alcoholism. It doesn't say we're going to have a miserable life. Or we'll end up taking it out because we have a disease that must be treated. So what happens is the bedevilments. The bedevilments are on page 52, and they are available in sobriety. We are having trouble with our personal relationships. Anybody having a little trouble? We couldn't control our emotional nature. Mm. We were prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to others. Personally, I think that's a fabulous diagnosis for an antidepressant. And that's usually what happens. We sit in Alcoholics Anonymous for 12, 15 years, and we've got to take an antidepressant because, you know what, i got all those going on. You know how I know that? I had to. Yeah. I had three anxiety attacks and sobriety. Blow in the bag. How humiliating is that? First try to find a paper bag these days. My husband hands me one of those plastic ones. Almost die. You know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you can't find the little lunch bags like you could in the 60s. And uh, three blow-in-the-bag anxiety attacks, because when this disease is untreated, that's what happens. Oh, I hate when I hear people taking antidepressants when it's untreated alcoholism. Do some people in these rooms need it? You bet. I say it's 1%. I'm going to go out there and say it. There. So what ends up happening in untreated alcoholism, though, guys, is you're tooling along. You might be taking your antidepressants. It's all good. And then the next thing you know, you have, to, you have to have a root canal, something pretty benign, right? You bite into something, break a tooth. You're getting older. Teeth are kind of getting dry. And uh, you bite into something, cracks a tooth. You need a, you need a root canal. What happens when you need a root canal? You're going to have to have some Vicodin. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they, got, they got the pad sitting right there. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to sign the pad anymore. I go in there. I see that pad. I'm thinking, oh, he wouldn't miss the whole pad. And I'm like, oh, Katie, now that's, that's alcoholic thinking. I have no idea how much da- t- danger I'm in. And what happens is they say, you're going to need some Vicodin. You betcha I need some Vicodin. And I take that Vicodin. What happens? It takes care of that malady. See, it triggers the allergy. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm rescheduling more dental work. <laughs> Matter of fact, root canal the whole mouth. I'm in. And, and, and see, what we don't understand, guys, is when I'm sitting in untreated alcoholism, I will trigger the allergy with pain meds. We lose more people behind pain meds than we ever have in the past. And this is what people say. I said it. When I say people say it, it's me saying it. I say pills weren't my deal. Like I'm telling my allergy. If you're allergic to cats, it doesn't matter if it's an alley cat or a Persian. It's a cat. Right? So what we've got is we've got the problem I've got is the failure of self-will. I've missed 60 to 63. If I just said that and you don't know what's on 60 to 63, you are in way more danger than you think you are. I, I'm telling you. I didn't know what was on 60 to 63. All of a sudden, I'm tooling along. My husband gets sick. He gets sick, and I can't figure out what it is. He's a high-end cabinet maker. I'm a fitness professional. Both of us have no good medical insurance, all catastrophic. Something's wrong with Joe's brain. We can't figure out what it is. And so he says, about three years we go through this stuff because our insurance is bad, and this psychiatrist says, I think it's organic. What the hell does that mean? You know, organic, all I can go to is pot. You know what I mean? I'm thinking, what does organic mean? Kind of like mechanism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, those words. And um, <laughs> what would be the mechanism that's required to get, would that be a faucet? Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I digress. That was personal. Uh, and so, uh, so Joe gets sick, and we don't know what it is, and all of a sudden I'm sitting at my sick AA meeting that I was an active member of. See, when you're sitting in untreated alcoholism, the last place you want to go is where they're studying the book. Mm-mm. No, no, no. I want open discussion meeting where I can talk about me. <laughs> and uh, so my meeting is sick, and we're talking about how well we are. We're the wellest group in the world, and all those other people are studying that stupid book. And, you know, we're going on and on and on and on. I'm 15 years sober, and my girlfriend's sitting next to me, and she says, you know what, Katie? 
She says, if you drive a school bus, you get instant medical insurance. Swear to God. Yeah. Well, I'm out there managing my ass off, right? I'm I'm in constant collision with somebody or something. Doesn't matter. That's life. That's what I'm thinking. And so I go down and I, I apply for this bus job and I get it immediately. And the next thing you know, I go through 20 hours of training and I'm on a bus. And I tell Joe, honey, I am on a bus. We have an HMO. Get on down to the doctor and find out what's going on. Now, do you hear this level of self-centeredness? All I want is my husband to get medical testing. I don't care about the school system. I, don't, I do care about the children, but I don't. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that the school's expense helped me because it's not really hurting anybody. I mean, if I screw the government, it's not hurting anybody. And so the truth is, is I get on that bus and what happens? Oh, my God. Am I in over my head? First of all, do I look like a bus driver? Okay, the fashion there, wow. They needed serious fashion work. I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried the best I could. But So I go in there, and all of a sudden, um, I'm on the bus, and I'm at the middle school, and these two boys behind me get in this big old fight, and I'm at upper middle class. You know, I'm not in the hood. I'm at upper middle class. These two boys, blood is everywhere. I'm like, oh, my God. I grab both of them by their shirt cuff because I'm a tough little gal. I left home at 15. I left that part out. I am an absolute pain in the ass, right? I mean, my dad never came looking for me. So imagine that, <laughs> leaving a little womb out there in the world, you know. And my dad did not come looking for me because that's how I go. That's how I roll. That's what I, there was no running away. I take these two boys, and I'm walking like this, and one of the other bus drivers yells at me and goes, Did you get the key? I'm like, no. I run back. I go get that key out, you know, and I get those boys. I take in the principal. I throw them in, and I look at those kids on the bus. I said, let me tell you something. You screw this deal up. Sure, God. I'll take each and every one of you. I've got a sick husband at home. I'm in untreated alcoholism. I will take you out. Oh, you know. So I get back, and I look at that bus, and I swear to God, they are jumping from one seat to the other, and that the wheels are coming off like this. I get on that bus. I thought, oh, okay. You want to you wanna fight with me? Oh, I'll win. I'll win. And my son goes, Mom, everybody at school thinks you're crazy. It's like, I am. I am crazy. And so I'm on that bus, and I swear everything was like this up here. You you don't turn around on a bus. You don't do this. The bus goes whatever way you look. And I had a gas-powered bus, man. That baby went fast. And and I swear to God, uh, there was it was a high-end neighborhood, and there were a lot of rich people. And I had a lot of old ideas on rich people. And and this one guy in this BMW, and he and I kept hitting the same intersection together, and he'd try to beat past me, right? And so I'd just pop out those reds and that stuff. So I'm like, (laughs) who's winning now? You know, he'd look at me and go, what is up with you? It's like, ha, 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 Oh, yeah, this one 16-year-old kid is still talking about me. I swear to God, I jumped off the bus and stuck my head in his car. Yeah, he's like, he's got a popsicle in his mouth, he, or a sucker. He goes, lady. I'm like, ha, 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 Oh, the sound of that air brake would scare him to death. Oh, my God. And it was just insanity. But here's the deal. I I tell Joe, I go, oh, my God, I can't do this bus any longer. You know, I've been on the bus three weeks. I can't do it any longer. And I said, go to the hospital. I'm driving you right now. We're getting your brain scanned. I don't care. We're getting your brain scanned. And I said, now, listen, this is what they're going to do. They're going to ask you all kinds of questions. They're going to say, like, touch your nose. You be sure and touch your elbow. And and they're going to say, touch your knee and you touch your ear. Because, see, I'm running the whole show. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Oh, yeah. That's what I do. I read minds, and I run the show. And uh, so we get into the hospital, and this doctor comes in, you know, and he's got his little white jacket on, and he says, so you think there's something wrong with his brain? I thought, yes, I do. Yes, I do. He needs a CAT scan. And, of course, the doctor does not like me telling him what he needs. And so he goes, well, Joe, let's see. He goes, you know, um, uh, touch your nose. Couldn't believe he said it. Joe goes, Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We just had this discussion. He goes, he goes, touch your elbow. And Joe's looking at me like. Now, 
See, on page 61, it explains what happens. The show doesn't come off very well. <laughs> this ain't working. We got to have plan B quickly. And so I'm, go, I'm thinking, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to knock this doctor out. I'm taking his jacket with his name on it, and I'm shoving him in a tube right now. You know what I mean? I'm getting Joe on a gurney, and he's going in a tube. Well, long story short, the doctor asked him several math questions, and Joe couldn't answer them. And he says, um, we're going to go ahead and, and scan your brain. And at that point, guys, when, he went, when the doctor came back in, he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, my God, your husband has a massive brain tumor. He said, I've never seen one that big. whole side of his brain's on one side. And, you know, guys, my very first thought was that I am going to be driving that damn bus for the rest of my life. That's the level of self-centeredness I'm dealing with. See, now I didn't say anything to my husband. I didn't go, oh, great, now I'm going to drive the damn bus. I mean, I'd grown up enough. But that's what I'm talking about. You hurt or threaten me. How is this going to affect me? And, of course, it was a hell of a road for six years. I drove that damn bus for three years. Don't send your children on the bus when they say they're going to throw up. Uh, Because they do. They throw up on the bus. All righty. But my husband was sick. And here's what ended up happening, guys. He got very, very sick. And we're in untreated alcoholism and don't know it. I'm managing my ass off. Oh, my God, I can't even begin to tell you the pain I was in. It was horrible. And the next thing you know, he's convinced all the doctors to give him all kinds of meds, all kinds of meds. And six years later, he dies of a heroin overdose. Yeah, 23 years sober. So when I say I take untreated alcoholism serious, I'm, I, it, it's hit me very close to home. And here's the sad news. You almost lost me, too. At 15 years, the obsession to drink came back, and I couldn't believe it. It came back so subtly. And then the next thing you know, man, I'm not doing well. I called it the monkey on my back. I go to my, uh, my husband and my, uh, my current husband, my new husband, my next husband, whatever we're going to call him, the love of my life. And I said to him, I said, man, I'm not doing well. He's in untreated alcoholism, too. And he says, well, just don't drink without me. Oh, lovely, <laughs> lovely. That, sh- that should do it. And uh, believe it or not, that bought me a little more time because God's grace is amazing. But when it, the light turns out, the light turns out. And the next thing you know, I run into a group of big book thumpers, and I don't want to be there. Oh, God, do I not want to be there. I hate you people. And, and it was Mark Houston. And I had the privilege of having Mark Houston over at our house every Thursday night for four years till he passed away. He was there the night before he passed away, and he absolutely rocketed my world. And today I'm here to tell you guys, Alcoholics Anonymous is the center of my life. I know what rocketed into the fourth dimension means. See, I I wasn't working the steps. I was doing what Katie thought was working the steps. And when I really, really had that second surrender to the third step, which I think, unfortunately, people go to other programs because they don't understand the root of my problem is selfish and self-centered. They don't get that. I'm sitting there. I pick out this sponsor. I I picked out a woman sponsor, and I said to her, I said, man, I'm having major trouble. She knew about Joe. And she says, Katie, I want you to read 60 to 63. And I read 60 to 63. I flipped the page open to 62, actually, and you'll have to forgive me. I have to cuss because it makes the story real, is um, I opened the page to selfish and self-centered. And I thought, did that bitch not hear a word I just said? Oh, my God. I have lost my husband 18 months ago. I am still in tremendous pain. And I called her back and she said, Katie, there's a big difference between sorrow and self-pity. And you've crossed it. You are in complete self-pity. And that's what ended up happening to me, guys. And you talk about rocketing into the fourth dimension. I've only got about five minutes left, so I've got to really speed through this part. But here's what happened. I started working the program every step as it's lined out in the book. Oh, my God. I listened to Mark Houston at a big book study, and I lean over to Charlie. I go, my God, what book is he reading from? I've not even heard this stuff. And so what ended up happening is, you know, I've been a victim of my own delusion. I can rest satisfaction and happiness if I just manage well. I am the actor running the whole show. I don't even get the fact that I'm just the actor. I'm not the director. And you people have to do everything in order for me to feel safe. You have to do what I need you to do. You hurt or threaten me. I'm not in a good place. So you must behave because I'm so self-centered. See, I don't think too much of myself or too little of myself. I only think of me. 
You don't enter the picture. The book says, I love what you said. The book says moral and philosophical convictions galore. I can't live up to them. I am going to be a mediocre mother. I really am. The book tells me I can't do it. Can't do it without God's aid. My husband speaks too, and I swear you cannot imagine how much trouble I have with him being the center of attention. I can't stand it. I am better than he is. I really am. I just need you to know that. And um, he speaks, and if we've been fighting, I think, I hope he lays an egg. <laughs> Moral and Phil, I can't, see, in my DNA, you heard her threaten me, and I got to blow you up. That's just what I do. I got to talk about you. I got to gossip about you because it's all about me. And that's what ends up happening, guys, is that this level of self-centeredness will drive me into the, into insanity. And if, if, to get in touch with this power, the 11th step is not sufficient. As a matter of fact, it's only half of a step if you look at prayer and meditation. People talk about, well, you know, I haven't really been doing much prayer and meditation as if that's the answer. If I'm blocked, I'm not going to hear God if he had a bullhorn. I might have a moment of clarity, but a moment of clarity is absolutely nothing without action. See, this weekend, if I'm waking you up, oh, please stay awake. Please get into the book. Get that annoying big book thumper as your sponsor. I dare you. You know what I mean? Get that person that bugs the crud out of you but knows that book completely. And get them to walk you through the steps. See, I've got to realize that my troubles are of my own making. I am an extreme example of self-will run riot, comma, Though I usually don't think so. Is that a delusion or what? See, selfishness and self-centered, that is the root of my trouble. I am driven by a hundred forms of fear. When it says I'm driven, I'm not choosing to act this way. I get so tired of people saying that we're, you know, we, we have so much drama in our lives. What? what? That's, that's the root of my illness, guys. I'm an extreme example of self-will run riot. Though I usually don't think so. I'm absolutely delusional over the kind of character I am. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear. Could have said a thousand forms of fear. Fear is not my problem. It's self-centered fear that's my problem. God gave me fear to know who the creepy guy in the room is. And I know who you are, by the way. But uh, God gave me that innate sense to know it's danger. The problem is, is when it's all about me. And so what I've got is I've got, I'm a self-seeker. I can't even trust my motives. I'm a self-seeker even when trying to be kind. I take this fabulous motive. I run it through my delusion. It's utopia. If everyone would do as I wish, the show would be great. I'd be happy. You'd be happy. Who wouldn't want a life like that? See, it's the insanity of that stuff. See, I'll tell people, oh, I'm a nice guy. I'll hold the door open for you, but you better say thank you. See, I don't, I'll let you in in traffic, but you better wave. See, that's not being kind. That's all driven by a motive. Now, those are, those are obvious ones, and I'm, I'm going to end with this story because you got to see the heightened awareness of self-centeredness, guys, always comes in you, your form. I see self-centeredness in all of you guys, right? I mean, and if you don't think you got the level of self-centeredness that I got, let me follow you around today, please, please, please. Because we all got it. Absolutely we have it because it's the root of our problems. It's the root of my disease. And my troubles have got to be of my own making. I have got to see where I made a decision based on self, which later placed me in a position to be hurt. I can't ever tell you that I've been done wrong. Mm -mm. Nope, nope. I made a decision at some time to place myself where I placed myself. And then you did me wrong. And so the truth is, is until I can be free, the only way I can be free is the problem has got to be me, right? Well, this is the way we do it. We do it through the inventory process. Self manifested in various ways is what caused our failure. We've got to get down to those causes and conditions. We talked about that in six and seven where half of you guys were gone. So you'll have to get the CD to hear all that. But the truth is, is because I don't have enough time, because I want to end with this one story. And this story is It's really my favorite. The paragraph on 61 explains how I behave, right? It says the show doesn't come off very well. How many of you guys have a plan and it didn't come off very well? Yeah, damn it. Just today. Heck, yesterday. I had four the day before. You know what I mean? I mean, name. Yeah, okay. So it doesn't come off very well. So what do I do? I step back and I become more demanding or more gracious. 
whatever the case may be, because I've got to figure out how to work you. Now, I don't know I'm doing this. It's not like I'm rubbing my grubby little hands together. This is just me. This is a day in the life of Katie. And so what I do is I come back, and so I go back at it again, right? Self is going get to get you to see. I've got to self-seek. Explaining is self-seeking. If I could just explain it to you a little bit better, you'd understand. And so I'm going to self-seek. Still, the show does not suit me. I may admit I'm somewhat at fault, but others are more to blame. The guy that spoke on the fourth step was so right on. It's all my part. There is no my part, your part. It's all my part. I take 100% responsibility for what happened. So I have this young child. This story is going to take about three minutes. I know it's hot, but just hang in there with me. So I have this young child. He's 22 years old. He's just had a baby. Oh. And um, he is, he's married this girl, and we love her, and they've been together four years, and I'm going to help them buy a house. Life's going pretty good for us. I'm going to help them buy a house. It's going to be their wedding gift. And in Texas, everything's foreclosed on like it is here, and you can get a house for a pretty good deal. And so we're going to look at about a $75,000 house, and, and you know, they're, they're kind of dumpy. No, they're not kind of dumpy. They really are dumpy. And so um, my husband says, well, you know, go, go to 80000 So I go to 80000 Oh, mm, they're still dumpy. So I have to convince my husband that we're going to go to 95000 right? So we go to 95000 They're still pretty dumpy. And uh, now my work is just convincing my husband. How hard is that? Not hard at all. Okay, that is a cakewalk. So the next thing you know, I have convinced my husband. It's taken me three months, but I have convinced him that we're going to go to 125000 Yeah, yeah, because the children need this. And the difference between 75000 and 125000 was an amazing house. So we're signing on the dotted line, right? And the kids are so excited. My, my daughter-in-law is pregnant because they always do it backwards, right? They, they seem to get pregnant then get married, maybe. And so she's gigantic pregnant, and this whole deal is going great. And my son looks at me and says, Mom, how much is that mortgage payment going to be? And I thought, oh, well. And there we looked online, and it told us it's like going to be like you know $1,000. And my son looks at me, and he goes, Mom, I can't afford $1,000. And I thought, oh, I'll, well, I'll help you. Well, I really don't want to help him. I kind of want him to be on his own. I mean, and the next thing you know, she's crying, he runs out of the room, and all hell breaks loose. Do you see that I am a producer of confusion rather than harmony? I wanted these children to have a $125,000 house that they could not afford. Four and a half months, we looked for house, house, house. And all of a sudden, I realized, my God, I've upset everybody. And these kids can't afford it. And Sam says to me, Mom, and he's crying. He goes, I'm, I'm going to be a father, and I want to be independent of your money. That's fabulous, isn't it? Except not today. Not today. So, oh, no, not, not today. It's not, not fabulous. Not fabulous. Not even feeling it. Not feeling it. So I go into my husband. I look at him. I go, just buy the damn house. Buy the whole thing. Just buy the whole thing. He goes, I am not going to buy the whole house, Katie. You know, and I'm like, plan B. Still, the show doesn't come off very well. Everybody's, everybody's crying. I go, oh, 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 my God. It, it's a, the whole deal is off the table because I was running the whole show. I believed I knew what was best for everybody. See, I'm a producer of confusion rather than harmony even when my motive is good. And that's just one indicator, guys. And i got to tell you something. Here's, here's what I'll end on. I always say that for about seven more times. But um, I'll let you in on that one. Um, what would happen if we actually worked all 12 steps, right? Four through nine is to clear away the debris. Nine goes on for a lifetime. Most of us just clean away the debris of the instant tornado. Rarely do we make all the amends. I swear, I, I doubt anyone sitting in this room that has made all their amends. I'd like to say I haven't made all my amends because I know there's some out there I'm not even aware of. I'm completely asleep to who, I'm, who I've harmed. But the truth of the matter is, is that we continue to make amends. And then we end up going and we, we live in the disciplines of 10 and 11. And then we carry the work through the 12th step, which is the magic step. It says in our book, it is our duty to do this. You know what a duty is? It's a vital part of life. It's a responsibility you have. If you are not sponsoring, I always like to say shame on you, but that really sounds too harsh. Um, why are you not sponsoring? Why are you not carrying this message? If you don't have a message to carry, who better to get a message from? The CD guys. 
Oh, my God, there's big book studies out there, Sandy Beach, Bob Bazan's. There, there are heroes in this program that can give you uh, the help you need, walk you through the program step by step, line by line, however you got to do it. But you've got to carry the message out of the big book. Trust me, I don't care if that bothers anybody. I really don't. I've, I've already lived in that pain. I'm so doggone afraid of those bedevilments ever coming back in my life that by the time I pick up the vodka, it is the relief. See, the bedevilments are what scare me to death. I don't ever want to live in that pain again. And I lived in it for years. And I know what anxiety is. I know what depression is. I know what feeling hopeless is like. I kept thinking God was out here. I had no idea I'd blocked him inside of me. And so by the time I drink vodka, it is the solution. And alcohol is my solution when I have the malady on me. That's why I drink. I don't worry about drinking today. It's not even on the table. My spiritual life, if I step away from this book, it's absolutely on the table. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.